Hi and welcome to my lecture on the evaluation of the pelvis. To download my lecture slides, please go to my WordPress site, Docina Obigaine. Here are the references for this lecture. And here is the outline of this lecture. So we have three main uh, parts of the bony pelvis. We have the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. Of course, in the middle right here is the symphysis pubis where the two pubic bones connect or meet. Okay, so we have the sacrum here, the coccyx, okay, and the ischial spines that is partially covered in this uh, drawing. All right, so uh, when we talk about uh, the pelvis in uh, obstetrics, no, we talk about the false or greater pelvis and the true or lesser pelvis. Now, what is the demarcation between these two? It is the linea terminalis. Okay, so anything above the linea terminalis is the false or the greater pelvis. And here are the borders. Okay, so posteriorly, the border of the false or greater pelvis is the lumbar vertebra. Okay, so laterally, the borders are the iliac fossae, and at the front, the border would include the lower anterior abdominal wall. Okay, so anything below the linea terminalis is what we are really concerned of no, in obstetrics, and this is what we call the true or the lesser pelvis. Okay, so the, here are the borders of the true or lesser pelvis. So superiorly, of course, is the linea terminalis. Posteriorly, it's the promontory here and the alley of the sacrum anteriorly is the upper margin of the pubic bones ascending superior rami of the ischial bones and the obturator foramina inferiorly of course it's a pelvic outlet and laterally the inner surface of the ischial bones and the sacrosciatic notches and ligaments okay let's just reiterate the important uh, parts of the pelvis that is uh, very important clinically in obstetrics. Okay, so we have here the ilium, okay, so the pubic ramus, the ischial spines, okay, the sacrum, the sacral promontory, the coccyx, symphysis pubis, and not shown here will be the ischial tuberosity. Okay, so the pelvis is described as having four imaginary planes. However, in obstetrics, what will be clinically important would be only three planes, which is which are the inlet, outlet, and the mid pelvis. Okay, so the fourth imaginary plane is the plane of greatest pelvic dimension, which has no obstetrical significance, and therefore we will just um, focus more on the three important or clinically important planes which are again the inlet outlet and the mid plane or mid pelvis okay so here are the um, three important planes okay the uppermost plane will be the inlet followed by the mid plane and then the lowermost plane will be the outlet okay so let's first talk about the pelvic inlet now this um, uh, plane forms the brim of the true pelvis Okay, and it is also called the superior strait. The pelvic inlet is also the superior plane of the true pelvis. It has four diameters. Okay, so the AP diameter, the transverse diameter, and two oblique diameters. Okay. So under the AP diameter, we have the three conjugates. Okay, the diagonal conjugate, the obstetrical conjugate, and the true or anatomic conjugate. Okay, so the conjugate or the AP diameter runs from the symphysis pubis up to the sacral promontory. So let's first talk about the diagonal conjugate, which is this one. Okay, that's the line or the distance between the lower border of the symphysis pubis up to the sacral promontory. And this measures approximately 12 centimeters. So this is the only AP diameter, okay, or the only conjugate that can be measured clinically. Okay, so the obstetrical conjugate and the true conjugate cannot be measured. However, their measurements can be indirectly uh, assessed or estimated using the diagonal conjugate. And I will show you that later. Now, how do we clinically measure the diagonal conjugate? So this is how we do it. 
Okay, so with your examining hand, no, two fingers of your examining hand will be inserted into the vagina and then reach for the sacral promontory. And then note where the inferior border of the symphysis pubis touches the base of your finger. Alright, so the distance between the uh, tip of the middle finger up to where the inferior border of the symphysis pubis touches the base of your finger is what we call the diagonal conjugate. That is measured in centimeters. Okay, take note. It is measured in centimeters, not in inches. Alright. Okay, so next will be the true or anatomic conjugate. And this will be the distance between the upper margin of the symphysis pubis up to the sacral promontory. And this usually measures around 11 centimeters. Now, how do we approximate? The measurement of this conjugate okay again no we derive it from the diagonal conjugate by subtracting 1.2 centimeters from the diagonal conjugate so the last conjugate will be the obstetric conjugate and this runs from the midpoint of the symphysis pubis okay up to the sacral promontory this clinically important obstetrical conjugate is the shortest distance or the shortest AP diameter no? connecting the sacral promontory in the symphysis pubis. And this is um, approximately around 10 centimeters. Okay? So how do we uh, estimate this uh, conjugate? We measure this indirectly by subtracting 1.5 to 2 centimeters from the diagonal conjugate. Now, we talk about the oblique diameters of the pelvic inlet. This extends from the sacroiliac joints to the opposite iliopubic eminence, and this usually measures less than 13 centimeters. Okay, the transverse diameter of the pelvic inlet is constructed at right angles to the obstetrical conjugate. So, this is the transverse diameter, which is at right angles to the obstetrical conjugate. And this represents the greatest distance between the linea terminalis on either side of the pelvic inlet. It usually intersects the obstetrical conjugate that is uh, at a point approximately 5 cm from the promontory. Okay? The average length of this transverse diameter is about 13 cm. And uh, this transverse diameter divides the inlet into anterior and posterior segments. Now, the plane of the greatest pelvic diameter corresponds to the roomiest plane of the pelvis, the borders of which will include posteriorly the third to the fourth sacral vertebrae, laterally the ischial bones, anteriorly the middle surface of the symphysis pubis, and its AP diameter and transverse diameters uh, average 12.5 centimeters. The next uh, plane is the mid pelvis, or another term would be mid plane. And this is measured at the level of the ischial spines, which is this one. Okay? This is also called the plane of least pelvic dimensions. Okay? because this is the narrowest portion of the pelvic cavity. Now, during labor, the degree of fetal head descent into the true pelvis may be described by fetal station. No? So, the mid -pelv and the mid pelvis and ischial spines serve to mark zero uh, station. In other words, the, when the biparietal diameter of the fetal head uh, is at the level of the ischial spines or at the level... Uh, touches the intervenous diameter, that would mean that the fetal head is at station 0. Okay, So the AP diameter through the level of the ischial spines normally measures at uh, at least 11.5 centimeters. The mid pelvis extends from the lower margin of the symphysis pubis through the level of the ischial spines up to the tip of the sacrum. Okay, so again, as I've already mentioned, the transverse diameter is this one, no? the distance between the two ischial spines or what we call the interspinous diameter. So the interspinous diameter, again, represents uh, station zero. Okay? The level of the ischial spines represents station zero. Now, um, aside from measuring the uh, uh, inter 
uh, spinous diameter, what are some of the ways by which we can assess the adequacy of the midplane or the mid pelvis? Okay, so, so here are some of the other ways. Okay, so if you see these findings, these are findings that are pointing towards um, a contracted mid pelvis. Okay, so number one is the prominence of the ischial spine. So as you can see here in this picture, no, so you touch the the examiner touches the ischial spines and when he, the examiner um, assesses this ischial spines to be prominent and then that is indicative of a contracted mid pelvis another one another another technique is when the examiner uh, assesses the pelvic side walls now if the pelvic side walls are convergent as opposed to being divergent then this is uh, indicative also of a contracted mid pelvis Okay, another is assessing the concavity of the sacrum, this one, no? So if the concavity of the sacrum is shallow, then that is also, again, indicative of a contracted mid-pelvis. The third um, plane is the pelvic outlet. Okay, so the outlet is bounded anteriorly by the pubic arch, okay, laterally by the ischiopubic rami, is tuberosity and sacrotuberous ligament and then posteriorly by the tip of the coccyx. So a while ago when we talked about the midplane, no, we mentioned the interspinous diameter. Okay, so here in the pelvic outlet, we now uh, involve the intertuberous diameter. Okay, so the intertuberous diameter or the distance between the two ischial tuberosities will be uh, approximately 11 centimeters. Okay, so the pelvic outlet consists of two approximately triangular areas. Okay, so this is the uh, anterior triangle, okay, which is also called the urogenital triangle, and the posterior triangle, which is also called the anal triangle. Okay, they have a common base, which is this one, which as you recall no, from the previous slide, this is the distance between the two ischial tuberosities, so this will be the intertuberous diameter. So clinically, three diameters of the pelvic outlet usually are described. So we have the AP diameter, the transverse, and the posterior sagittal diameter. So we put the closed fist against the ischial tuberosities. No, usually if the interischial or sorry, the intertuberous diameter um, accommodates four knuckle bones, then that would mean that uh, the intertuberous diameter or the pelvic outlet is adequate. Okay, so the intertuberous diameter may be measured again, no, by placing a closed fist against the perineum at the level of the ischial tuberosity. So what is Thom's rule? Thom's rule is when the transverse diameter plus the posterior sagittal diameter is more than 15 centimeters. But this is only um, applicable when you do X-ray pelvimetry. So if it's more than 15 centimeters, then that would mean that the outlet is adequate. Again, this is only applicable when an X-ray pelvimetry is done. Alright, so at this part, we will now learn about the caldwell molloy anatomical classification of the pelvis or this is the classification that determines the pelvic shape. Okay, so these concepts uh, aid in the understanding of labor mechanisms. Now, this can explain to us why some patients or some women are able to deliver vaginally while some women... Uh, experience dystocia and therefore deliver their babies by cesarean section. So basically, we have four types of pelvic shapes. We have the gynecoid, the android, the anthropoid, and platypoloid. Some books would say that the two main shapes would be gynecoid and android, and then the uh, two intermediate uh, ga pelvic shapes would be anthropoid and platypoloid. So the greatest transverse diameter of the inlet and its division into anterior and posterior segments are used to classify the pelvis as gynecoid, anthropoid, android, or platypeloid. Now the posterior segment, if you recall no, from the previous slides, 
uh, determines the type of the pelvis, whereas the anterior segment determines the tendency. Okay, so again, this is a very uh, nice uh, summary of the characteristics of each uh, pelvic shape. So we have here the gynecoid. So this is no, from the word uh, gyne or the root word gyne. This is the most common type of female pelvis. Okay, and this is the shape that is the most ideal for childbearing. You can see here a well-rounded anterior, lateral, and posterior segments. Next is we have an android pelvic shape. So from the word android, no, you will derive that this is a male, uh, a male uh, shape pelvis. No, it is um, a heart-shaped pelvis. As you can see here, heart shape it has increased incidence of posterior fetal position. Okay? So in, in this uh, type of uh, pelvic shape, you have a contracted midplane and a contracted outlet, which again no, increases the chances for the uh, mother to undergo cesarean uh, section delivery. Okay? Uh, next will be the anthropoid or the oblong type of a uh, pelvic shape okay so this is oval or oblong shape and you can see here that the AP diameter is greater than the transverse diameter as opposed to the platypeloid okay the platypeloid has a transverse diameter that's longer than the AP diameter and this is actually a rare shape of uh, pelvis and when you see the shape this is not really conducive to vaginal delivery Okay, so for the last part of this lecture, we talk about the soft parts of the pelvis. So the pelvic floor is that muscular partition that separates the pelvic cavity from the perineum. It is, uh, or it has three sets of muscles. Okay, so the pubococcygeus, the iliococcygeus, and the puborectalis. Okay, so collectively, these um, muscles, three muscles, are collectively known as levator ani. Right. So vaginal birth conveys significant risk for damage to the levator ani and to its innervation. Of these muscles, the pubococcygeus muscle is the more commonly damaged. Okay, evidence supports that these injuries may predispose women to greater risk of pelvic organ prolapse or urinary incontinence. So you can just imagine those multigravids or the grand multigravids why uh, they are very prone to pelvic organ prolapse because of you know, repeated vaginal births may induce uh, or will, uh, will induce significant uh, damage into these uh, muscles of the levator ani. Now, what is the pelvic diaphragm? So, the pelvic dia diaphragm consists of the levator ani, remember, these three muscles, plus the coccygeus muscles here, and their uh, corresponding fascial covering. So, the pelvic diaphragm has two parts. Remember, in we already discussed this in the pelvic outlet. So, the pelvic diaphragm, like the outlet, is con uh, composed of two parts. So the anterior triangle, which is the urogenital triangle, and the anal triangle or the posterior triangle. The urogenital triangle, as you can see here, comprises the vagina and the urethra, while the anal triangle comprises the anal opening. The nerve supply of the pelvic diaphragm is from the S4, inferior rectal nerve, perineal branch of the pudendal nerve. So the pelvic diaphragm supports the pelvic organ, such as the uterus, okay? And it also has control of the external anal sphincter and it can stabilize the sacroiliac and sacrococcygeal joints. The anterior triangle or the urogenital triangle contains portions of the urethra and vagina as previously mentioned, certain portions of the internal pudendal artery branches and the compressor urethra and uro, urethrovaginal sphincter muscles, which comprise part of the striated urogenital sphincter complex. Now, this posterior triangle or the anal triangle contains the ischioanal fossa, the anal canal, the anal sphincter complex, which consists of the internal anal sphincter, external anal sphincter, and the puborectalis muscle. 
branches of the podendal nerve and internal podendal vessels are also found within this triangle. Alright, so that is the end of this lecture. So in summary, we talked about the composition of the bony pelvis, pelvic anatomy, specifically the true and false pelvis. We also uh, talked about the three uh, planes of the bony pelvis, that's the inlet, mid pelvis, and outlet. The different pelvic shapes, gynecoid, android, anthropoid, and patipiloid. And lastly, we also uh, talked about the soft parts of the pelvis. So that's it for my lecture. Thank you for watching.